Chapter One of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. Chapter One The Wishing Stone. The children's room of the library was very still. Once in a while a murmur arose at the delivery desk, or some squeaky-shoed small feet crossed from open shelves to reading table. Occasionally a helpful child leaned across to another and whispered, "'That's a dandy book. Have you read the rest of them?' But all of these minor sounds were blended into the general effect of stillness and seclusion and they did not even reach the ears of a small boy named Wendell, who bent over a large volume on one of the low round tables. He did not hear the footfalls nor the murmurs. He knew nothing of the rumble of traffic that rose through the windows. He was not even conscious of the gathering dusk, though the librarian began to snap on lights in dark corners. Wendell read on and on, giving an excellent imitation of a bookworm. Absorbed as he was in his book, you probably picture him as a slight, pale little chap, somewhat underweight for his ten years, with pale cheeks, a bulging brow, large horn spectacles, completely immersed in a volume of Emerson's essays. Not at all. He had a round, brown face, a strong, lithe body, excellent arm and leg muscles, and nice brown eyes that were in unusually good condition because he never overworked them on school books. He had never opened Emerson's essays in his life, and the large volume that just now held his attention so completely was a book of fairy tales. Wendell never read anything but fairy tales unless it happened to be required reading at the select school for boys that he attended. In fairy tales he reveled. He read them in bed with a light on at night. He read them before breakfast, and thus made himself late at school. He hid them behind his geography and study periods. He took them to Sunday school till his teacher found it out. He read them in the street when he went on an errand, and greatly irritated traffic policemen by trying to cross the street reading. Altogether it was proverbial in Wendell's family that he could always be kept out of mischief by a fairy tale but oh, what low marks he did get in school. For he didn't like to study. He liked baseball and swimming and roller skating, but he didn't like the capitals of the United States, nor dates, nor fractions. Particularly, he didn't like fractions. Thoroughly entranced, he read on till another boy reached across in front of his page to get a book lying on the table. The interruption roused him. He glanced up, saw that the lights were on and the afternoon waning, reluctantly rose and returned his volume to the shelves, and sauntered out with two books of fairy tales under his arm. He strolled through the upper corridor with an approving glance at the great panel of the muses, who looked to him like fairies on a large scale, but his goal was the delivery room at the other end with its wonderful paintings of Sir Galahad and the quest of the Holy Grail, illustrations deluxe of one of Wendell's favorite folk tales. Long he lingered over Sir Galahad arriving at the castle of the maidens, and long he gazed on the old spellbound king. He sighed deeply as he left the room at length. Oh, to have lived in those days! Through a cross street he hurried along to the esplanade. Here was a fairyland indeed, had Wendell but had eyes to see it. The sunset glow had not yet faded from behind the classic buildings on the river front, and twin necklaces of lights were strung between city and city, but it all seemed to the boy depressingly modern and unromantic, no suggestion to him of fairies or giants or witches or wishes. He walked along, still under the spell of his library reading, regretting that there was not enough light to read as he walked, hurrying home to open his fairy books. From the embankment he turned into an old-fashioned street on the slope of Beacon Hill and began to climb the heights. His great-great-grandfather had lived on that street, in Wendell's present home, 
in the early days when fashion first built up the hill. His great-grandfather and his grandfather and his father, in turn, had lived there through many changes, as fickle fashion turned to newer avenues. As Wendell paused in front of his house, a stern square front with a door whose solidity and heavy brass knocker and sentinel side-lights gave the impression that it had been put there to keep people out instead of to let them in, he was hailed by a friend across the street. Sammy Davis's father had a name that ended in Idsky when he lived in Russia, but after he came to America and moved into one floor of the decadent mansion next to Wendell's, the family had decided to give an American twist to the name, so Davis it had become. Sammy Davis crossed to Wendell. Where you been? Library. Get a book? Yep. Let's see it. Sammy reached for the two books, grabbed them. Wendell grabbed in turn. Perfectly willing he was, of course, to show Sammy the books, but who doesn't resent having things grabbed? Sammy ran across the street. Wendell followed, chased, ducked when Sammy dodged. There was an upright stone post at the inner edge of the sidewalk, barring vehicles from entering a narrow blind court that opened opposite Wendell's house. Sammy dodged behind this, then out again, ran around in a circle and back to the post to dodge once more, then ran out again, then back to the post. The chase was prolonged, and I suppose that they encircled that post a dozen times. When Wendell at length secured both books, he vaulted up and sat on top of the post, which was roughly hewn and small on top, and not so very comfortable. Still, you could stick on. I'll tell you, Sammy, he said. You come over tonight, and we'll each read one. Oh, Jehoshaphat! He had suddenly remembered his homework, a double allowance of fractions because he had failed today. Make it tomorrow night, Sammy, he said. I've got homework tonight. A window on the fourth floor above was raised. A frowsy head stuck out. Sammy, called a strident voice, come in and eat. So long, sorry to leave you, said Sammy, and departed upward, while Wendell sat and mused on the post. Once more he drifted away into memories of fairy tales. At length he shook himself with a heartfelt, though silent, gee whiz, I wish I were living in a fairy story right now, here in Boston, and slid down and went in to dinner. Wendell's family consisted of his father and mother and two older brothers, Alden and Otis. Just now there was also a visiting relative, Cousin Virginia, a sprightly young lady from New York, who tolerated Boston because it was only five hours from her delightful hometown. She seemed to live in a constant state of amusement at things that Wendell's people didn't consider funny at all. Her greeting this time to Wendell was, Well, Ralph Waldo Theocritus Shakespeare, how's the public library today? Wendell didn't see anything funny in that. He grunted. Did you happen to see that interesting new volume of correspondence between Socrates and Lady Jane Grey? Wendell didn't even know that this was intended to be funny. I was reading fairy stories, he said. Shocking, said Cousin Virginia, a descendant of the Puritans. As to that, broke in Wendell's brother Alden, who was a junior at Harvard, specializing in original sources, the Puritans had some imagination. Look at witchcraft. Look at the wishing stone. What wishing stone? asked Cousin Virginia. I've seen the kind they set in a ring on a girl's third finger. Do you mean that kind? This bit of levity fell flat. The wishing stone, said Alden, was a projecting boulder in the common, somewhere near the present junction of the Beacon Street Mall and the Oliver Wendell Holmes walk. There was a tradition that if one walked or ran nine times around the stone and then stood or sat on it and silently made a wish, the wish would come true. And here you've shown me all the sights of Boston and left that out, cried Cousin Virginia. Why, it's much more interesting than Bunker Hill Monument. Let us hie us thither by moonlight as soon as we finish dinner. 
Careful, Wendell, if your eyes should pop right out, you couldn't put them back. The stone, said Alden, is no longer there. Oh, where is it, Alden? cried Wendell. According to the early diarists, returned Alden, most of those boulders on the common were used for building stone from time to time. I doubt whether its history could possibly be traced. Well, why couldn't they hang on to it when they had it, said Wendell, in deep disappointment. Then he went up to his room to do his homework, that sad double lot of fractions. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of It's Your Fairy Tale You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pixie Starts It Of course, Wendell's intentions were excellent. He fully meant to devote himself to that homework, to forget the fairy stories that still hung like a mist about his brain, and tackle those fractions like a man. But we all know how it is, just as soon as we have looked at this one funny page of the newspaper, or read this one verse, or found out what the next chapter is about, we will certainly settle right down to business. There was the arithmetic. There were the two fairy books from the library. Unless you are a seraph with wings and always do your duty, you will not be surprised to hear that Wendell treated himself to just one peek at the fairy stories before doing his homework, and that he never thought of those fractions till he heard his mother's step on the stairs, when he shoved the fairy book into his desk drawer and opened his arithmetic at random. "'Bedtime, my son. Have you finished your lessons?' asked his mother. "'No, bothersome lot. Can't make anything of this example. Have to give me another half-hour,' muttered Wendell, not really wishing to deceive his dear mother but a little bit ashamed to tell her how he had neglected his duty. "'I'm sorry, dear, but you'll have to do it in the morning. You mustn't lose sleep, and your brain will be clearer then. I'll tell Jane to call you half an hour early.' "'Many are called, but few get up,' as the proverb hath it. Wendell, next morning, was not one of the few. Jane's call fell on sleepy ears. He turned over for one more snooze, woke an hour later to find himself way behind time, hustled through his dressing and his breakfast, and was off to school with lessons unprepared, a sad thing that happened only too often in his easy-going life. He managed to slide through most of his recitations, badly but not disgracefully, until he came to the arithmetic class. I might tell you in detail of his tragic, floundering through problems that he was supposed to have prepared of his guilty acknowledgment that he had not made up the delinquencies of yesterday and the day before, and of the stern wrath that was visited upon him by the arithmetic teacher, a strict and disciplinary spinster whose patience he had often tried in the past. But this is not a school story. I have to record only such a part of his troublous career as led directly to the wonderful adventure of the wishing stone. So, briefly, he was kept in, with three days' problems to finish before he could go home. His teacher, who bore the singularly happy name of Miss Ounce, left him alone in the deserted schoolroom. She had a lesson to give in another part of the building. Wendell pulled his book in front of him, flipped the pages open to the proper place, ran his fingers through his hair, and remained in that attitude which may have denoted either deep concentration or utter dejection. He read the first problem through twice, and it had no more meaning for him than Dante's Inferno in the original tongue. Gee, Jerusalem, he said aloud after a long pause. "'Can I be of any assistance?' asked a friendly voice. It came from a little being perched on the desk in front of him, who certainly had not been there a moment before. He was about the size of a two-year-old child, but he had the face of an old man, a genial old man with twinkling eyes. His body was very round and quite filled his suit of blue-knitted jersey, and his arms and legs were long and spindling. "'For goodness sakes, who are you?' gasped Wendell. "'I'm a pixie,' said the being. "'You are,' said Wendell. "'I didn't know there were any, out of fairy stories.' 
"'But I'm in a fairy story,' explained the pixie politely. "'I'm in the same fairy story you're in.' "'Am I in one?' said the startled Wendell. "'Since last night,' declared the pixie, "'you wished to be, you know, on the wishing stone, "'after you had run around it nine times. "'It's a sure charm.' "'The wishing stone? "'Is that the old wishing stone, the alley post?' "'Somewhat fallen into disuse,' assented the pixie, "'but nevertheless the wishing stone.' "'Well, I never,' said Wendell. "'It was so stupendous, such an unbelievable piece of good fortune, "'that at first he did not grasp its possibilities. "'Then his eye fell on the open book lying on his desk. "'Say,' he exclaimed, "'if that's all true, if I'm really living in a fairy story, "'There ought to be some way of settling junk like this in short order.' "'He gave a vindictive thump to the arithmetic. "'That's what I came for,' said the pixie. "'I thought I saw a business opening here.' "'You mean,' faltered Wendell. "'Why, I'll do your problems for you. That's easy. "'And you do three tasks for me.' Three? "'Yes, it's always three, said the pixie. "'Say, I think I ought to get more than just these problems for three. "'I think you ought to do my homework till the end of the term.' "'Just as soon,' said the pixie. "'No trouble to me. Is it a bargain?' "'But what will you want me to do?' said Wendell. "'I don't know what I want you to do,' returned the pixie. "'How should I know? Take a chance. Be a sport.' "'All right,' said Wendell. "'I will. Here are the problems.' "'Look in your desk,' said the pixie immediately. Wendell opened it. There lay three sheets of large pad paper covered with problems completely solved. Wendell's name and the date were written at the top in his own handwriting. The work was done neatly enough to pass, but not so excessively neatly as to arouse suspicion. "'Well, you are some little fiend at arithmetic,' pronounced Wendell with great relief. "'Glad you are satisfied,' said the pixie. "'Of course, you understand that if you can't perform my tasks, you belong to me.' "'Well, I might as well belong to you as to Miss Ounce,' ruminated Wendell. "'Come on with your first task. I suppose it will be water in a sieve from the Charles River, or something like that. They always are.' "'I should say not,' said the pixie, with scorn in his voice. "'That might be... "'All very well for the old kobold that lives under Flagstaff Hill. "'It's just his style, in fact. "'He's using the same stuff he did when Merlin was practicing. "'No, I like to advance with the best thought of the time. "'I'm no back number. "'Trust me, I'll find something up to date.' "'Well, speed up,' said Wendell. "'What do you want me to do?' "'How should I know?' said the pixie. "'Give me time. "'I'll drop around tonight and let you know.' Just as he was speaking, the door opened, and in came Miss Ounce, and maybe Wendell didn't jump. He started so conspicuously that Miss Ounce fixed him with an accusing eye, and said, "'Well, Wendell, up to mischief, I suppose, instead of doing your work.' "'No, Miss Ounce,' said Wendell, noting with relief that the pixie was nowhere in sight, and promptly handed over his papers. Mm, murmured Miss Ounce, "'very good.' "'Might be neater. Everyone right, though. "'Now, Wendell, why is it that when you can do such excellent work as this, "'you have such a shocking daily record? "'Yes, shocking is the word.' "'Wendell knew the answer to that, but he didn't give it. "'He took his lecture silently, standing first on one foot and then on the other, "'but his mind was on the magic task that the pixie was to set him, "'and as soon as he could, he slid out of the room.' End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of It's Your Fairy Tale You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pixie's First Task The Pixie came that evening true to his word. Wendell, undisturbed by fractions, luxuriously idling over his fairy books, looked up suddenly and there sat the funny little fellow on the foot of the bed. "'How are you?' said the pixie. "'I didn't have time to say good-bye today. "'Your Miss Ounce turned the door-handle too quickly.' "'That's all right,' said Wendell. 
Are you ready to spring my first task yet? Yes, sir, said the pixie gleefully, and you can't say it isn't up to the minute. You must bring me an airplane that you have found traveling underground. Why, there's no such thing, said Wendell vexedly. An airplane traveling underground, how silly. An airplane doesn't travel underground, how can it? Don't ask me, shrugged the pixie. How should I know? You can't expect me to make up the tasks and think up the answers, too. Be reasonable. And he vanished. Wendell was greatly cast down. It's a fool task, he said as he went to bed. In fact, it's impossible. He woke with a sense of calamity hanging over him. Really, it was almost as bad as having fractions on his mind. He was so serious at breakfast that Cousin Virginia asked him if he was practicing to be a Puritan ancestor at a fancy dress ball. This levity seemed to Wendell ill-timed. The brooding anxiety lingered with him all through school time. What if he couldn't do the task? What would it be like to belong to a pixie? He didn't like the prospect. He came out of his school on Beacon Street, still with the cloud lowering over him. He felt desperate. He thought of going over to the train yards of South Station and stealing a ride in an empty cattle car bound for the prairies of the West. He meditated stowing away on a ship bound for Timbuktu or Guam or somewhere. Just then a tempting truck passed him, southbound on Beacon Street. It was low and it was going slowly, and altogether it offered just the right opportunity to hook a ride. Wendell seized the opportunity and the truck together and dodged down inside, unseen by the driver. In Alston, Wendell dropped out again. His mind was somewhat relieved by this pleasant adventure, and he didn't wish to get too far from home. He hailed an electric for Park Street. Now you may not believe it, but the first thing he saw when he got on the car was an aeroplane, a toy aeroplane about four feet long, carried in the arms of a freckle-faced boy. Wendell sat down by the boy. Does it go, he said. Sure it does, said the freckle-faced boy. How, said Wendell. You wind it up, said the boy. It was apparently a perfect model of a large aeroplane, a fascinating toy. The freckle-faced boy let him hold it, let him examine it closely. It was a joy to see such a perfect mechanical model on that small scale, but suddenly it brought a leaden lump to Wendell's heart. It reminded him of his impossible task. "'Where are you taking it?' asked Wendell. "'Home. I live in Medford.' "'Change at Park Street?' said Wendell. "'Scolly Square,' said the boy. They were now opposite the public garden. "'I'll bet it can travel,' said Wendell. "'You've said it,' replied the boy. "'But,' he added, grinning, as the electric sloped down into the subway, "'this is the first time it ever traveled underground.' Wendell nearly bounced from his seat. "'Say,' he almost yelled, "'what'll you take for that aeroplane?' "'Don't want to sell it,' said the boy. "'I just got it.' "'But if you should sell it,' persisted Wendell. "'But I ain't a-gonna sell it,' said the freckle-faced boy. "'But if you ever should want to sell it,' reiterated Wendell, "'say, there's something you know you'd rather have.' "'Well, I don't know. What, for instance?' "'I'll give you anything you like for it,' offered Wendell, "'who was rapidly formulating a plan in his mind. "'Wouldn't you like a gun now?' "'I've got a gun,' said the boy. "'Don't you want a dog?' pleaded Wendell. "'Is it a trick dog?' asked the boy. "'Do you want a trick dog?' questioned Wendell. "'Yes, I do. "'Well, it is a trick dog,' said Wendell. "'Just you get out here. "'For meantime they were nearing Park Street, "'and I'll show him to you. "'I live right near here.' "'What tricks can he do?' asked the boy. "'You wait and ask him,' said Wendell.' Once out of the subway, Wendell left the boy on a bench on the common and sprinted across the green expanse in spite of the official sign, Keep off the grass. If you want to roam, join the Navy. He shot round the corner of his street, circled the wishing stone rapidly nine times, climbed on top of it, and said to himself, I wish for a trick dog that will do any trick you tell him to. 
Woof, woof, said an ingratiating voice near him, and there was the dog. He was of no special breed, just a lost dog breed of mongrel, but he had the look in his eye that means a dog will do anything in the world for you if he loves you. "'Sit up and beg, old fellow,' commanded Wendell, and the dog sat up with an excited little bark. "'Heel,' ordered Wendell, who had no time to lose, and the two chased excitedly through the streets to the common, and there, to Wendell's relief, waited the impatient boy with his aeroplane. "'Here he is,' said Wendell. "'Here's your trick dog.' The freckle-faced boy looked him over critically. "'He ain't much to look at,' he said. "'Well,' said Wendell, "'you didn't say you wanted him to take a prize in a beauty contest. "'You asked for a trick dog.' "'What can he do?' asked the boy. "'You just try him,' said Wendell. "'Dead dog,' said the freckle-faced boy. The dog dropped flat and rolled over motionless. He didn't even blink an eye. "'Live dog,' said the boy, and up he jumped, and frisked and wagged and was very much alive. "'Is that all he can do?' asked the boy. "'No, he can do any trick,' said Wendell. "'I don't know em all myself. He knew him when I got him.' "'Where'd you get him?' asked the boy suspiciously. "'Given to me,' said Wendell. "'Let's have the aeroplane.' The boy hesitated. Perhaps he was afraid that the dog had been stolen were found by Wendell and might soon be claimed by the police. But the dog himself settled the question. He jumped up on the freckle-faced boy and woofed engagingly, and when the freckle-faced boy stooped to pat him, he licked the boy's freckles so warmly and wetly and scratchily and lovingly that the boy hastily handed the aeroplane to Wendell and gathered the dog right up in his arms, and the bargain was complete. Wendell had a few pangs himself. The dog had found a warm place in his heart, too. But he consoled himself with the reminder that he could wish for another just like him any time. And he had the aeroplane. He took it over to the parade ground on the other side of the common and tried it out. It flew beautifully. On its own merits, apart from Wendell's need to satisfy the pixie's demand, it was a very desirable possession. It struck Wendell as strange that whatever adventures the wishing stone had thus far brought him seemed to increase the number of things he had to wish for. He had never yearned for an airplane before, but now it seemed to him that he couldn't bear to part with this one to the pixie. Of course, he had often thought he would like a dog, but now that the wishing stone had brought to life this wagging, barking, loving morsel of a pup, Wendell was almost unhappy without him. He wondered if it would be that way all the time, if every granted wish would produce more ungranted ones. If that were so, it would really be happier not to begin the endless chain, not to have the first wish granted. That was the way it turned out in a good many of the fairy stories, the black pudding, for instance, on the end of the old woman's nose. A great truth was almost within Wendell's grasp for the moment, that it is not the attainment of a wish, but the effort to attain it that brings us happiness, that right activity, not idle possession, is man's happiest endowment. Wendell had his finger on this key to happiness, but as he was only a small boy flying a toy aeroplane, and not a great philosopher, he did not grasp the key but let his thoughts wander to the pixie, who would probably be all ready with another task after dinner. When the pixie suddenly appeared that evening, sitting this time on top of the chiffonier, with his thin long legs drooping over the drawers, Wendell said triumphantly, "'Well, I got the aeroplane.' He stroked it lovingly where it stood balanced on his desk. "'Why, yes, it's an aeroplane, all right,' granted the pixie but it isn't traveling underground. But it was when I found it, protested Wendell. A boy had it in the subway. The pixie looked crestfallen. I never thought of that, he admitted. You win. Tell me all about it, he added with some curiosity. Wendell told him the whole thing, but the pixie looked grave when he mentioned the wishing stone. You're not using them up too fast, are you? he said doubtfully. That makes two, you know. 
Two what? said Wendell. Why, two wishes. You only have three, you know. Is that a fact? asked Wendell anxiously. I didn't know. Is that straight? Of course, said the pixie. Everything goes by threes in fairy stories. I'm afraid you're right, said Wendell gloomily. I know I am, said the pixie. Well, are you ready for the next task? All right. What comes next? asked Wendell. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know」by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wendell finds an unexpected ally. The pixie brightened a bit. I have a poser this time, he said. You must find an acorn on Acorn Street. It was Wendell's turn to look crestfallen. As every Beacon Hill boy knows, Acorn Street is only one block long, or rather one block short, and there isn't an oak on it. In fact, there isn't a tree of any kind. There isn't room for one. The pixie looked delighted, but he tried to assume a nonchalant air to hide his triumph. He swung one knee over the other carelessly and tilted his chin. Well, said Wendell, a bit discouraged. But the thought came to him that in every fairy story, the knight who passes the first of three tests always squeaks through the other two, also. So, of course, there must be some way out. I'll have to be going, said the pixie in an offhand way. You'll find your arithmetic paper in the desk drawer. See you tomorrow night. Hold on, said Wendell. You forgot the aeroplane. Forgot it? How? Aren't you going to take it along? Good gracious, no, returned the pixie peevishly. I can't take care of all the truck I tell people to bring me. I don't run a junk shop. Keep it yourself. I don't want it. Now that was great luck for Wendell. It brought a large amount of pleasure into an existence which would otherwise have been most cheerless, for the unsolved problem loomed before him of finding an acorn on Acorn Street. He chose to go through Willow Street on his way to school next morning, which brought him, of course, to the head of Acorn Street. There was the neat little sign fastened on the brick wall, a bunch of three acorns and the name in artistic lettering, evidently the creation of an artist's brain and fashioned by a master hand. Wendell had an inspiration. He would cut out one of those acorns and take it to the pixie as a last resort. Of course, he might be arrested and put in jail for mutilating a street sign, but after all his trouble, the pixie might not consider it an adequate acorn. Still, the suggestion was something to fall back upon. Standing at the top of the extremely steep slope, which is Acorn Street, Wendell surveyed the prospect doubtfully. He saw a narrow cobblestone roadway. On his left, a trim row of doll houses each with its projecting doorstep, an old-fashioned scraper, its spotless white door and shining brass knocker, and a narrow brick sidewalk where two thin people could just walk abreast. On his right, a long brick wall broken by neat back doors, and a still narrower brick sidewalk where only one very thin person could walk abreast. Nowhere was there a tree, nor room to plant a tree. There were a few straggling blades of grass between the cobblestones and between the bricks, but not a crevice large enough to accommodate a single acorn. A postman came along, whistling cheerily. Wendell stood off the brick pavement to let him pass. Perhaps the postman could help. "'This is Acorn Street, isn't it?' asked Wendell. "'Some people call it that,' responded the postman jokingly. Millionaire's Alley, I call it. Why, are they all millionaires here? asked Wendell. Just about, said the postman. And I knew this street when there were three families in every house, and the walls that black with dirt you could write your name on them in chalk. But these millionaire artists discovered it. Nuts, I call them, with their glass studios on the roof and their packard cars that have to back out whenever the ice truck comes through. Wendell felt that they were wandering from the point. "'But did you ever see an acorn here?' he asked. 
Nope, said the postman, no acorns here. They named it that, I guess, because it isn't big enough to be named for a full-grown tree, like walnut or chestnut. Peanut Street, I'd call it. Well, I've got to get to school, said Wendell. He jogged down the short but precipitous length of treeless Acorn Street, and so on to school. After school, as he started for home, the public garden tempted him, and he turned in from Beacon Street. It was a warm October day, and the garden wore an air of resuscitated midsummer. He sat down on a bench on the Charles Street side, facing the lake, which looked very attractive, although it was no longer bright with the little boating parties and slow-gliding swan boats of summer. A flock of doves, seeing Wendell settled to stay, fluttered down all around him for expected crumbs, and some busy little sparrows, who were always more alert than the doves and captured twice as much food, hopped along the path. Wendell felt in his pockets for stray provender, but without results. A gray squirrel, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, loped through the rustling leaves and ran up the bench that Wendell occupied. He had a very busy air as of one who stops for a moment only in the midst of pressing engagements. A slight inadvertent movement of Wendell's sent him scurrying down again. He frisked through the dead leaves, dug up something of interest from among them, and sat up on his hind legs to handle it. Wendell saw that it was an acorn, and noticed that he was sitting under a young oak. Pity they couldn't plant a few of them where they belong, he said bitterly. After the squirrel's desertion, he sat there a few minutes longer, but the pigeons, too, soon found that he had no picnic to offer them, and flew off in a flock to a small girl with bare knees, accompanied by a French bonneted nurse who had a whole bag of popcorn. He got up then, and, kicking the leaves before him, shuffled out to the wide entrance at Charles and Beacon Streets. A traffic policeman, very military-looking and trim khaki, was holding up the Charles Street traffic while automobiles spun up and down Beacon Street. Wendell, pausing on the curb, saw him suddenly check the Beacon Street traffic while still holding the Charles Street lines at bay. The large square expanse was quite clear, except for the khaki figure with both arms uplifted. Charles Street truck drivers prepared to speed up. Beacon Street automobilists craned their heads out to see what was delaying the long double lines. Foot passengers lining the curbstones looked impatient and watched the traffic man for the signal that did not come. Apparently he had forgotten what he was there for. Then a smile spread along the curbstone ranks, a smile that merged into a ripple of laughter quite unusual among self-contained Boston pedestrians, as the impatient waiters saw that the majestic khaki officer was holding up scores of important citizens to let one small gray squirrel cross the street. It was Wendell's little friend of the public garden, still intent on pressing business who, unmindful of all safety-first rules, was taking a diagonal cut from corner to corner across one of the busiest thoroughfares of Boston. I know that squirrel. He lives in Lewisburg Square, Wendell heard a man say. I know him by the look in his eye, which shows how cocksure of their own judgment some people are. The squirrel made the farther corner in safety. The traffic man gave the signal. The crowd surged forward, Wendell with them. He crossed by right angles to the squirrel's corner and saw that busy little beast frisking along Charles Street with the deliberate purpose of one who knows his goal and then turning up into quiet Chestnut Street. Wendell followed him, as it was his direct route also, but it was not until the squirrel turned from Chestnut Street into West Cedar Street that Wendell saw with fast-beating heart that he carried in his mouth an acorn for his winter storehouse. If the squirrel should, oh, if only he should. Yes, opposite Acorn Street, he paused. 
It was evident that he had intended to proceed along West Cedar Street to Mount Vernon Street, which bounds Lewisburg Square on the nearer side, but on the doorstep of a West Cedar Street house sat a cat, a sleek gray pussy, and when she saw the squirrel she grew tense all over and began to quiver, commencing at the tip of her tail, and the squirrel saw her and turned up into Acorn Street. Would he drop it? Oh, would he? Would no yapping puppy come to the rescue? Would no tidbit of garbage tempt him to investigation? No, Acorn Street appeared deserted by man and beast. Its aristocratic spotlessness offered no hope of a bread crust or even a banana peel. But just then, one of the spotless white doors opened. A baby girl emerged right in the path of the squirrel. He was not alarmed. Baby girls had been a bountiful providence to him since his infancy, but this baby was a determined little maiden whose brain and hand worked in unison. Quick as thought she grabbed the squirrel's beautiful bushy tail, and quite as quickly she loosed it, for the little gray chap dropped his acorn and turned his sharp teeth upon that plump little hand. Then, as he felt himself free, he scurried up the hill without stopping for anything and turned westward toward Lewisburg Square. When Wendell passed through the square, the acorn safe in his trousers' pocket, the squirrel was still chattering excitedly on the branch of a tree, scolding everyone in particular and in general for the loss of his acorn. "'It's a shame, old chap,' said Wendell, pausing to peer at him through the iron railing but I'll bring you a bag of peanuts to make up for it, you old lifesaver you." The pixie wore an air of quiet triumph when he appeared in Wendell's room that evening. So did Wendell. Well, said the pixie, did you give up this time? Not this time, said Wendell, quietly, but with great enjoyment, and he fished the acorn out of his pocket and laid it on the desk in front of the pixie, who glared at it savagely. Well, said Wendell, are you satisfied? Oh, yes, said the pixie, ironically. It's an acorn. I know an acorn when I see one, thank you. But there aren't any oaks on Acorn Street. I know it, but a squirrel brought it all the way from the public garden and dropped it there. I saw him. A common or garden squirrel, asked the pixie incredulously. Garden when I saw him, said Wendell, but he might live on the common for all I know. Some nutty squirrel, said the pixie dejectedly, to block my game that way. He sat fingering the acorn as if he hoped it would turn into something else. Ah, he said, brightening suddenly, but I've thought of something for the third test that's a sticker. What is it, a postage stamp? asked Wendell. You won't feel so funny, young man, when you know what it is, said the pixie, glaring. End of chapter 4、chapter、five of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This is a LibriVox recording in the public domain. A Frog Somewhat Out of the Common. I suppose it's a beacon from Beacon Hill, said Wendell. Now that's not bad, conceded the pixie. I may use that some time. No, triumphantly, it's a frog from the frog pond. Jehoshaphat! exclaimed Wendell. You've got me this time. The pixie grinned. I certainly think so, said he. For if ever a frog made its lair in the frog pond, it was long before the present memory of man. The frog pond is a pool on the Beacon Street side of Boston Common. In shape, it is somewhat like a lima bean. It has a concrete bottom. Near one end, there is a gushing fountain, and at the other, a drain that keeps the water fresh. In warm weather, hundreds of Boston children go swimming there every day brown skinned, black eyed Italians, little Russian Jews, a small sprinkling of native Bostonians, quite a large handful of little Negroes. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, no doubt, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, but never, never a frog. 
In winter, when the pool is frozen, it is a skating pond, and Flagstaff Hill, just above it, makes an ideal start for a sled to go whizzing down across the icy glare of the frog pond. Popular opinion has it that it was this very slide on the common that was made famous in the winter of 1774 and 1775 by the contest between the youngsters of Boston and General Gage's Redcoats, then quartered on the town, who tried to spoil the slide with sand and ashes. Instead of submitting timidly, the boys carried their complaint to General Gage himself, who assured them that they should be undisturbed in future, and said in comment, How can we hope to beat the notion of liberty out of these people? The very boys breathe the air of liberty. Historical truth compels me to state, however, that the frog pond was not the scene of this interesting passage. It was undoubtedly on School Street, in the neighborhood of the historic Latin school, that the boys' slide was spoiled, and it was done by the servant of General Haldemand, who was in command under General Gage, though General Gage was indeed the court of appeal that decided in favor of the Latin school boys. As to the servant, I think his idea was a good one, for I have disastrously tried to walk down School Street myself on an icy day. But if the Frog Pond was not the actual site of this historic strike for liberty, it may be called the direct spiritual descendant of whatever frozen pool had that honor. For the boys and girls of the Frog Pond in these modern days breathe the air of liberty, and the grown people of Boston know it, and the police know it. The Frog Pond, within close view of the Massachusetts State House, within three minutes' walk of Boston's financial center, and within a stone's throw of the shopping district, belongs exclusively to the youngsters. Any grown-up may occupy a bench on the walk and watch the fun, but he mustn't complain if he happens to get splashed. Neither must he object to large groups of girls and boys all around him struggling to exchange wet bathing suits for dry clothes without the shelter of a dressing room. The youngsters are required to put on their bathing suits at home, but after the swim, who can be expected to traverse blocks and blocks of city streets in a wet bathing suit? They do the best they can to create for themselves a privacy that doesn't exist. They bring newspapers and old blankets and sit under them on the grass to dress. They form close rings around each other at critical moments, and the mayor of Boston consents because he is very human and very sensible. And the common police, who have all known the delights of the frog pond and the difficulties of dressing in public in their own boyhood days, turn their backs, and the majority of staid Boston citizens, walking home to dinner past the pond after office hours, approves genially, and is of the opinion that the small minority that disapproves would better walk home by some other path. To the frog pond, then, Wendell bent his steps the following afternoon. He wore his bathing suit under his shirt and trousers, though it was somewhat late in the season for bathing. The warm weather had brought out a number of adventurous souls, Sammy Davis among them. "'Hi, Wendell, come on in!' yelled Sammy. "'How is it?' asked Wendell. "'Fine, warm as can be.' Wendell didn't believe it. He knew the old trick of telling the newest comer how warm the water is. He stood undecided on the brick walk. "'Seen any frogs in there, Sammy?' he asked. Of course it was a foolish question, but it popped out before he could check it. "'Frogs? Naw,' said Sammy, in exaggerated denial. "'Frogs? Yeah,' said the other boys, and hooted in derision. "'I seen a frog.' piped up a bright-eyed colored baby in a bathing suit, improvised from underclothes, who sat on the stone curb and paddled his wriggling brown feet in the water. "'Seen a frog? Yes, like fun you did,' jeered his big brother. "'I did seen a frog,' reiterated the baby. "'There on the grass. There he is now.' Wendell looked where the brown finger pointed. Could he believe his eyes?' There, on the grassy slope of the hill, below the soldier's monument, 
actually sat and blinked a green and speckled frog. The brown baby and Wendell were not the only people who had seen him. A shout went up from the water, and at the same time an echoing shout arose from a group of small boys who were climbing around on a captured German tank on the crest of the hill. The boys on the tank began to scramble down. The frog sat and blinked stupidly. It seemed dazed or injured, but as the tank contingent cast themselves down the hill, it leaped with that surprising suddenness that characterizes frogs, and with its long legs shooting behind, plunged head first down the slope and into the water. For the first time within the memory of this generation, there was a frog in the frog pond. Wendell cast off his clothes and shoes and shot in after it. Phew, but the water was cold. And how to locate the frog? A needle in a haystack couldn't compare with it. Excitement reigned in the frog pond. Everyone gave chase. The water was not clear enough to show the reptile plainly, but occasional glimpses of it spurred on its hunters. They made futile grabs below the water. They swam and dove after that frog. Several times some boy's hand closed over it, only to find its slippery length wriggling through his fingers. At length it was captured by Izzy Icklebaum, who brought it triumphantly to the surface and held it in a tight grasp. "'Oh, Izzy, give it to me,' begged Wendell. "'I'll give you anything you want for it.' Izzy lent a businesslike ear to this offer. "'You will, eh?' he said, showing a large degree of interest. "'Will you give me your aeroplane?' In spite of his deep regret, there was not even a moment's hesitation on Wendell's part. "'It's yours,' he said. "'Here, give us the frog here in my stocking. "'Put your hands way in with him. "'That's the big idea. "'Now I've got him.' Released by Izzy, the frog gave a futile leap, only to find itself entangled in the stocking foot. The capture was complete. Wendell put on his clothes over his wet bathing suit, slipped his feet stockingless into his shoes, slung the frog over his shoulder, and started for home. "'I'll come in for it this aft,' shouted Izzy after him. "'Right o,' returned Wendell over his shoulder and sped on, his heart lightened of a tremendous burden, the last of the three tasks accomplished. True to his word, Izzy came over an hour later and bore off the aeroplane. Wendell tried not to care. He pinched the frog gently through the stocking to make sure it was there, and anticipated the pixie's disappointment. The pixie certainly was surprised. Wendell handed him the stocking and told him to feel inside when the pixie's hand came in contact with the cold, smooth skin of the frog, it gave the pixie his first shock. He got his second when Froggy, catching a glimpse of light through the opening, leaped violently out almost in the pixie's face. "'Well, I suppose that's settled,' said the pixie, when the frog had finally come to rest in a corner of the room. "'You really found it in the frog pond?' "'Yes, I did,' said Wendell, really and truly." So now I've finished the tasks, I'm glad to say. Well, I must say it's a great relief to me, returned the pixie. I never do know what to do with boys when I find them belonging to me. It's a great responsibility. I'm glad I'm not a mother. In spite of his relief, the pixie continued to look gloomy and to fiddle uneasily with a pencil on Wendell's desk. At last he broke out. Of course, I'm not doubting your word. But you know, and I know, that you couldn't find a frog in the frog pond, because there aren't any. But this one really was, said Wendell, distressed to see that the pixie was not quite convinced that he spoke the truth. I saw him jump in myself, and Izzy Icklebaum fished him out. Well, it's very fishy. I can't account for it, said the pixie. He remained in a brown study for several seconds. Then a bright thought illuminated his little old face. I have it. I bet I have it. Which side did the frog jump in from? Why, it came jumping down the hill from the soldier's monument. When I first saw it, it was near the top of the hill. Of course it was, cried the pixie, slapping his leg. 
That's where the old kobold lives. This is just like his work. He never had an original idea in his life. You mean, questioned Wendell, I mean this isn't a real frog at all. It's a person changed into a frog, by enchantment, you know. He's always doing it, pulling that frog stuff. Why, I can count one, two, three, seven times anyway he's used that same spell since Cinderella's godmother first suggested it. I should think he'd be tired of it himself. The frog sat and blinked at them with its goggle eyes. Wendell didn't like its stare. He began to feel uneasy. Suppose it was enchanted. Suppose it should go back to its natural shape. He somehow felt sure he shouldn't like that shape, whatever it might be. Of course, this complicates things for you a bit, said the pixie briskly. For me, faltered Wendell. Yes, you'll have to break the spell, you know. You seem to forget this is your fairy story, young man. But how, queried Wendell, it seems to me this business of living in a fairy story is just nothing but getting out of the frying pan into the fire. Well, you wished it, you know, said the pixie. He uncrossed his legs, crossed them the other way, gazed around the room, hummed a little tune. He seemed to be washing his hands of all responsibility. Sometimes if you throw a frog against a wall it will do it, volunteered the pixie. He spoke as if he had no interest in the matter. Do what? asked Wendell. Break the spell, of course. Wendell hated to do it. He didn't like the frog, to be sure, but that was no reason for hurting it. However, he advanced, under the compulsion of the pixie's words, grasped the smooth, cold creature, and hurled it against the wall, then jumped back, startled. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know」by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Enchanted Maiden In place of the frog, before him stood a beauteous maiden. She had a dazzlingly clear complexion, big infantile blue eyes, and a wealth of golden hair which she wore so as to conceal her ears. She was dressed simply but charmingly in a sport blouse and skirt, silk stockings and low shoes. "'Jumping caterpillars!' ejaculated the pixie. "'I guessed right!' "'You are naturally surprised,' said the beauteous maiden, in a low, melodious voice, "'to see me in place of that odious frog. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to you for giving me back my natural form, though it can only be for a brief time.' "'Have a chair,' said Wendell, as soon as he could recover from the shock. "'Thank you,' said the maiden, seating herself and gracefully crossing one knee over the other. "'As the story of my life is a long one, and my time is short, I will begin it at once. "'Once upon a time there lived a maiden who was so beautiful and so good that everyone loved her. "'That maiden, of course, was myself.' While I was still an infant, my mother died, and my father married again. He chose for his second wife a woman who had a daughter of my own age. For many years we were a happy household, but after a time my stepmother was transformed into a cruel witch by the magic charms of an old kobold. "'Hold on!' cried the pixie. "'Does he live under Flagstaff Hill on the common?' "'He does,' said the beauteous maiden." "'There! Didn't I tell you this thing was mixed up with him?' said the pixie, turning triumphantly to Wendell. "'I can always pick out his style.' "'The old kobold,' went on the beauteous maiden, "'gave my stepmother three magic gifts. "'The first was a cloak that rendered the wearer invisible. "'The second was a cap, and whoever put it on "'could read the thoughts of those about him. "'The third was a book of spells.' containing all the spells and charms ordinarily used by magicians. The old kobold decreed that my stepmother should remain under his spell as long as she held these gifts in her possession, but if she should be robbed of them she would lose her base powers as a witch 
and be restored to her original virtuous self. "'I see your work cut out for you,' said the pixie, in a low aside to Wendell. "'I cannot tell you,' continued the beauteous maiden, "'what a wretched life I led from this time on. "'I was dressed in rags, had only cold scraps to eat, "'and was forced to do the most menial work of the house, "'while my stepsister wore beautiful clothes "'and went to balls every night. "'Why didn't your father stop it?' put in Wendell. "'I've always wondered about that in these stepmother stories. "'Why the father stood for it. "'I was coming to that,' said the beauteous maiden graciously. "'My father died soon after his second marriage, "'and my stepmother married again.' "'I see,' said the pixie thoughtfully. "'She took a step farther. "'Yes,' assented the beauteous maiden, "'and he was a horrible giant whose favorite diet was little boys.' In addition, my stepmother made life a burden to me by her magic arts. She spied upon all my actions with the cloak of darkness, and she spied upon all my thoughts with the cap of thought, and she was constantly using her book of spells to annoy me. When I was making doughnuts, she would change the rolling pin into an eel, which would wriggle away from me, and annoying things of that kind. My stepsister, too, once as dear to me as my own sister could have been, seemed to come gradually under the cobalt spell. While every one admired and loved me for my youth, innocence, and beauty, she was so jealous that she constantly sought to do me an injury. At length matters came to a climax. One of the Boston papers held a beauty contest, and all unknown to me a good neighbor sent in my photograph in competition. It had been advertised that the winner of the contest would be offered a contract with one of the moving picture companies as a prize, but I knew nothing of it. Judge, then, of my surprise and delight when a reporter for the paper called to say that I had won the competition, and with it the contract as a movie star. But my joy was equaled only by the rage of my cruel stepmother and the jealousy of my ugly stepsister. They resolved that I should never sign that contract and my stepmother sent me at once with a letter to be delivered to the old kobold, requesting him to put the bearer to death. This horrible design would doubtless have been carried out, but on the way to Boston I sat down to rest for a few moments in the Fenway and fell asleep. While I was asleep, a Metropolitan Park policeman happened that way and stood transfixed at the sight of my beauty. Noticing the letter which I held in my hand, he took it, opened and read it, and was shocked beyond measure at the dreadful fate designed for me. He cast about for means to avert it, and at length wrote another letter requesting the cobalt to change the bearer into a fairy, and substituted this letter for the original one. Soon after I awoke and went on my way, all unconscious of these events. I presented the letter to the cobalt, who immediately used his magic charm to transform me. Unfortunately, the policeman did not write a very legible hand. The kobold read frog for fairy, and changed me to the horrible form in which you first beheld me. There's a lesson for you, young man, said the pixie severely. You don't write any too good a hand yourself. My time is short, went on the beauteous maiden. The courage and devotion of my rescuer, she turned a sad little smile on Wendell, who wriggled uncomfortably has made it possible for me to resume my natural form for a short time in order to tell my story. But soon I must return to the shape of a frog, so I will tell you of the further task that lies before you. You must go alone at midnight to the hill where the cobalt dwells, and summon him forth by saying these magic words, Green hill, green hill, open to me, I would the wise old cobalt see. "'Well, if that isn't conceited,' said the pixie scornfully, "'of all the nonsense, the wise old kobold, my word. "'When the kobold comes out, you must tell him "'that you have come to rescue the beauteous maiden "'and inquire his terms. "'He will ask you to perform a task for him, "'and when it is completed, I shall be free. "'I know just what he'll ask you, too,' put in the pixie. "'Same superannuated stuff. "'He'll ask you to guess his name.' "'Well, what is his name?' asked Wendell, looking from the pixie to the beauteous maiden and back again. "'How should I know?' shrugged the pixie. 
He doesn't know himself, really. He stuck to Rumpelstiltskin a few hundred years. But lately he changes it every time. He has to, you know, because he always gives it away himself, spinning round on one leg. That's just how much sense he has. Which side of the hill, I wonder, went on Wendell, turning to the beauteous maiden. But to his startled surprise she had vanished, and there sat the frog, as green, as goggle-eyed, as unintelligent, as altogether repulsive, as if it had never won a beauty contest in its life. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wendell works the midnight spell. How did she get that way? he asked the pixie, who only smiled gleefully and returned, It's a great life, isn't it, this fairy story business? Well, I suppose I've got to do it, said the harassed boy. How am I ever going to stay awake till midnight? I don't see. Oh, I'll wake you, my boy, said the pixie obligingly. You go to bed. And what am I going to do with him, with her, pursued Wendell, pointing vindictively to the frog. Now I know what she is. I've got to make her comfortable somewhere. She can't sleep in a stocking. The frog blinked and stared at him. Wendell stared back gloomily. He wondered if different frogs looked different to each other, like boys and dogs. It seemed to him that this frog was particularly ugly, even judged by frog standards of beauty. Well, poor thing, that was probably the cobalt's fault. I know what I'll do with her, he said. I'll put her in the guest chamber for the night. She'll like that. Virginia's away overnight. It wasn't very easy to catch the frog. It eluded Wendell with long-legged leaps, but Wendell cornered it at last with the help of the pixie, and carried it, its little heart pulsating with fright, to the dainty room that Cousin Virginia occupied, and tucked it into bed. "'One good job done,' said Wendell to himself. "'I won't have to sleep with that in the room tonight.' "'Well, old chap, I guess I'll go to bed now,' he said, yawning to the pixie. "'And if you will call me, say about eleven-thirty, I'll be much obliged. As he slid under the bedclothes and sprawled out in solid comfort, his foot touched something cold, clammy, repellent. He barely repressed a shriek. He threw back the bedclothes. Yes, the frog again. Now how did he ever get there? cried Wendell in bewilderment. I'm sure he couldn't open the door. It is magic for sure. She, you mean. You can't shake her, rejoined the pixie maliciously. It's your fairy tale, you know, and you are the rescuer. Well, what shall I do with her now? asked Wendell in despair. Do you suppose she'd stay here if I went into Cousin Virginia's room? Not for a moment, said the pixie. I tell you, you put her under the down puff on the foot of the bed, and I'll keep an eye on her. It seemed about five minutes after Wendell was in bed, when he awoke suddenly and found that the pixie was pounding him severely. "'Hold on, hold on!' he called. "'What's the matter?' "'The matter is I've been trying for the last ten minutes to wake you,' said the pixie, exasperated. "'The sleeping beauty had nothing on you. Hurry up now, or you won't get there at midnight.' Wendell tumbled into his clothes and tiptoed, as noiselessly as in him lay, down the broad old-fashioned stairs and still another flight to the basement. He did not dare risk the noise of the front door, so he emerged from the kitchen into the back alley, and thence to the street. Not a person was in sight, only a black and white cat prowled the gutters. A strange silence covered the city. Even the surging, seething roar of West End children at play, which rises all the evening, was stilled. Wendell's running footsteps, beating rhythmic time on the brick pavement of old Boston, alone broke the stillness. No traffic policeman presided over Beacon Street. He gained the common, skirted the frog pond, and faced Flagstaff Hill, and brave boy though he was, he did tremble in his boots. The frequent electric lights along the thoroughfares that bound the common drew glowing lines of light around it and there were bright lights at the intersection of the walks, 
but here, on the gentle slope of Flagstaff Hill, under the tall elms, a great black shadow lay. No Boston boy, born and reared among the historic traditions of the Commonwealth, but knows the somber legend of this site, that under this soil lie buried the Quakers and the pirates whom Puritan zeal executed on this spot in the early days of the colony. Cold chills ran up and down Wendell's spine as he stood here in the shadow and listened for the stroke of midnight. Presently it boomed forth from the old church on Mount Vernon Street, the same metal voice that struck the hour to the poet Longfellow when he stood on the bridge at midnight. Now was the fateful moment, and do you know, whether it was magic or whether it was scare, I can't say, but Wendell couldn't for the life of him remember that charm that was to summon the kobold. A striking of the clock, bringing with it the memory of that well-known poem which he had learned in school, had driven every bit of verse out of his mind, except his cousin Virginia's irreverent version of the same poem. I stood on the bridge at midnight as the clocks were striking three, and a cabman drove across the bridge and hitched his horse to me. On the eleventh stroke of the old church bell, the Park Street Church at Brimstone Corner took up the echo. Wendell, by a mighty effort, recalled the charm before the second sonorous voice had died on the still air. Green hill, green hill, open to me, I would the wise old cobalt sea, repeated Wendell. Suddenly another electric light on the path below sprang into brightness and sent a light streak across the shadow of the elms. For a moment Wendell fancied, and decided that it must only be fancy, that the ground trembled slightly under his feet. Then before his eyes there came a crack in the earth, as if a giant seed were germinating and pushing up a shoot. The crack widened. It became a tunnel extending apparently into the very heart of the hill, and suddenly, like a cut moving picture film that jerks a sudden change upon the screen, he saw that the mouth of the tunnel was occupied by an unexpected grotesque figure that could be none other than the kobold. Wendell had expected that the kobold would look somewhat like the pixie, but they had nothing in common except smallness of stature. The cobalt was about the size of a six-year-old, and had white hair and white whiskers, and a very long white beard that reached to his waist. He appeared to be wearing a belted velvet suit with full sleeves and breeches, and he was very stout and stocky. "'Who summons me?' he said, with dignity. "'I do,' said Wendell, advancing boldly, now that there was need for action. I should like to know how to free the beauteous maiden from your spell. The cobalt chuckled grimly, an exclusive sort of chuckle that made Wendell feel very much out of the joke. If you wish to win the maiden's freedom, he said slowly, you will first have to guess a riddle. You may have three chances to give the answer. If you guess correctly on any one of those trials, the maiden shall be restored to her original form. If you fail, she shall still remain a frog, and you too shall be transformed into another shape at my will. Good gracious, cried Wendell, is there as much to it as all that? I'm not going to be changed into anything at anybody's will. You can keep your old riddle and your frog too for all of me. He turned to go. Stay, cried the cobalt, so he stayed to listen. I might add, said the cobalt, that while the above terms are my regular ones, I might make a slight reduction in your case, as business is particularly dull just now. Indeed, to be candid, it is nearly a hundred years since I have had any opportunity to hold this guessing contest. Well, how much of a reduction, asked Wendell? Will you leave out the part about transforming me? Say, if I win, the frog changes back to the maiden? and if I lose, it stays a frog? No, no, returned the cobalt, such is not my method of doing business. The princes that have entered this contest in times past have at least agreed to be transformed for a limited time. Not for a moment for me, said Wendell. Times have changed. A week, say, urged the cobalt. I tell you, frankly, I shall not release the maiden for less. 
and if she is not released before one more year is run, she will be turned into a loathly dragon for life. "'Well, make it a week, then,' said Wendell, sulkily. "'Agreed,' said the kobold. "'Here, then, is the riddle you must answer. "'What is Boston?' Without a moment's hesitation, just as promptly as if he had been asked his own name, Wendell replied in Dr. Holmes's words, as any Boston boy would, "'Boston is the hub of the universe.' "'Wrong, wrong!' chuckled the kobold maliciously. "'I knew you'd say that. But there is another answer.' "'Well,' said the crestfallen Wendell, "'I'll go home and think it over. And say, do I have to come at midnight every time?' It's mighty hard to sneak out just then. No, I will make an appointment with you for any time you say, returned the kobold obligingly. Morning, evening, whatever you wish. Let's make it eight o'clock in the morning, said Wendell. I could drop in here on the way to school. Tomorrow, asked the kobold. No, hesitated Wendell. I'll need a little time on this thing. I'll wager you will, chuckled the old kobold growing almost slangy in his dignified glee. "'Say the day after tomorrow,' suggested Wendell. "'Agreed,' said the kobold. "'You will find me here outside the hill, and mind you bring back that frog. It is not your property, you must remember.' "'I will. I'll be glad to,' returned Wendell hurriedly. The frog was already on his nerves. "'And only two more guesses,' added the kobold. "'I know,' said Wendell meekly. He was very much mortified to have failed so quickly through his own assurance. He went back through the silent streets, let himself in quietly and bolted the back door, took off his shoes and groped up to his room where the pixie sat awaiting him. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know » by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cousin Virginia has a caller. Well, you deserve to lose, said the pixie, when he had heard the whole story, answering right off like that on the spur of the moment. You have to think these things over a bit. Besides, the hub has been moving slowly westward since Holmes's time. It's nearer Chicago now, I believe. But what did I tell you about old white hairs? Isn't he a back number? Trying to do business in the twentieth century the way he used to do it with those princes and slash doublets. Why doesn't he wake up and hear the birdies sing? How's the frog? asked Wendell anxiously. An awful nuisance, responded the pixie frankly. I think she's thirsty, but she won't drink. Oh, they can't drink, you know, explained Wendell. They take it in through the skin. That mug is too small. Here, I'll fill the basin and put her in. That seemed to content the frog. It sat and soaked and absorbed and goggled at Wendell, who regarded it moodily. If I can't do anything more for you, said the pixie, I'll move on. Hope you guess the riddle. Thanks, old fellow, said Wendell soberly. He was very sleepy and discouraged, but the frog looked a bit cheerier. Hardly was Wendell in bed when he dropped off to sleep, and five minutes later, blop, the frog leaped from the basin and landed on the boy's face, all wet and soggy and cold. Wendell, half asleep, struck out in self-defense and landed a whacking blow on the poor reptile that sent it halfway across the room. He realized instantly what he had done, and much ashamed of himself, he turned on the light, located the panting frog, and tucked it under the down quilt at the foot of the bed. Bitterly he regretted that he had not made an appointment with the kobold to return the creature the very next morning. When he had left for school, he hid the frog away again in his stocking, in a chiffonier drawer. But even his preoccupation with the Boston riddle did not entirely obliterate his uneasy fear that the frog might escape or be turned out of the house in his absence and thus plunge him into some other awful rescuing problem. He had hoped that the geography or history or literature lesson might enlighten him on the definition of Boston, and his attention to study was so strict 
that his teachers thought best to watch him even more closely than usual to forestall whatever mischief must be brewing but no ray of light came to him from any of his lessons he went home despondently assured himself that the frog was still safe and went out to play with cheerful sammy davis and the other fellows it seemed a long while since he too had been a carefree whistling boy with no greater anxiety and being kept after school for fractions, were being chased by Sammy's cross janitor. He had almost forgotten his troubles when he went in to dinner, but as soon as he ascended to his room to study, they all came back, for there sat the frog on his table, popping its eyes out at him most unpleasantly. I guess I'll study downstairs, he thought. I'll have the library to myself tonight. Mother and father have gone to the symphony, and I guess Cousin Virginia's out somewhere. He settled down comfortably in the library and was getting on famously with his lessons when the bell rang and a masculine voice asked for his Cousin Virginia. She came down presently and a lively conversation began in the front room, just out of sight but not out of sound of Wendell. He managed, however, to keep his mind on his work, for it was very silly talk and not at all interesting. The man was a Harvard student from New York, and they chattered on about strangers to Wendell, whom they knew in common. "'Do you like Boston?' Wendell heard the man say, and Virginia's clear and rather high-pitched voice answered, "'Of course I like Boston. I'll put it more strongly. I thoroughly enjoy Boston. I never supposed any place could be so... so historical, so absolutely thoroughly naively, unselfconsciously historical. Why, even little Wendell, she needn't little me, thought Wendell savagely, invited me to see a play he was to be in, in school. And what do you suppose? It was revolutionary, all about hiding away a wounded soldier, with allusions to the British encamped on Boston Common and the tax on tea. I don't believe Boston knows anything has happened in history since the Boston Tea Party. You've said it, said the young man, who seemed to admire Virginia very much. And their holidays, went on the foolish girl. When I was here last spring, I went out to shop on the 19th of April, and would you believe it, the shops were closed. Patriot's Day, if you please, when the farmers fired the shot heard round the world. I came in and said to Auntie, do you by any chance have a holiday in Boston on the 4th of July, Auntie? Why, yes, dear, she said, of course. I said, but why? It isn't Emerson's birthday, is it? And she said, why, my dear, you must know it is Independence Day. Oh, yes, Auntie, I said, but why celebrate it in Boston? That little event was pulled off in Philadelphia. Hasn't Boston enough? Ha, ha, laughed the young man. That was a good one on Boston. "'But the greatest pleasure I've had is the baked beans,' she went on. "'Pleasure,' echoed the young man. "'No pleasure, surely. "'Oh, I mean mental pleasure, to find they really are, you know, "'and not merely a myth. "'Of course I believed before I came here that they existed here. "'But as an occasional article of diet, "'why, they are a religious rite, an article of faith, every Saturday night.' "'Yes, and every Sunday morning breakfast at my boarding-house,' groaned the young man. "'Impossible! Inhuman!' said Virginia, brightly. "'Inhuman, but true,' moaned the young man. Wendell thought he had never heard such idiocy in his life. Delicious baked beans! "'But they not only eat them, they take them seriously,' Virginia's silly little voice ran on. I made a light and unworthy remark to one of Auntie's friends about the sacred bean. She looked at me compassionately and then said gravely, We always bake them with a small onion in the bottom of the pot. Yes, I don't know who said it first, but it is absolutely true that Boston is a state of mind. Wendell, listening with the utmost scorn to these trivialities, was suddenly brought up short. Boston is a state of mind. Three rousing cheers for Cousin Virginia. He went to bed happy that night. Even the presence of the loathsome frog was endurable. Tomorrow he would return the creature to the cobalt, 
and at the same time fling the answer to his riddle in his teeth, if he had any teeth. It would seem probable that a kobold with so much white beard would be too old to have teeth. The kobold was waiting for him on the slope of Flagstaff Hill next morning. So cleverly did his velvet suit take on the soft tone of the elm trucks that no one of the busy passers-by, hurrying on to business through the common, discerned him there under the trees, though Wendell saw him clearly. Or was it that he made himself invisible to other eyes? "'I've brought your frog,' said Wendell, drawing a long breath. He handed the stocking over to the kobold, and the frog leaped out and vanished among the fallen leaves. "'What is Boston?' asked the kobold mockingly. "'Boston,' said Wendell, with assurance, "'is a state of mind.' "'Wrong, wrong!' jeered the kobold, and was no longer there. But a little breeze rustled in the elm trees and brought a faint hissing message to Wendell's ears, just as the rushes whispered the fatal secret of the barber of King Midas. "'One more chance! One more chance!' Wendell went on dejectedly to school. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Breaking of the Charm. Several days passed by. No inspiration came to Wendell. The Pixie had no suggestion to offer, only unsympathetic criticism. You might have known that was too subtle for him. He's no deep thinker. I could have told you. His mother grew anxious. "'You mustn't study so hard, dear,' she said. "'You should have been out playing with the boys "'instead of poring over that memorial history of Boston this afternoon. "'Yes, I know it is fascinating reading, "'especially the earlier chapters. "'But you must think of your health, dear.' "'Cousin Virginia looked at Wendell solicitously, "'and Wendell knew she meant to be funny again. "'This was Saturday evening, "'and the family had just settled down in the library "'with the transcript.' each with a section. Alden had the news, Otis the sporting page, his father was perusing the editorials, his mother was reading the religious items. Cousin Virginia dabbled a few moments in the theatrical columns, like a canary unwilling to get wet all over in his china tub, and then laid down her section, suppressed a yawn, and said, "'Why does all Boston find its greatest dissipation Saturday night in reading the Saturday evening transcript. Habit, pure habit, growled Alden, without raising his eyes. Not altogether habit, said his mother, gently and seriously. The transcript, Virginia, is quite different from any other paper. It is reliable and conservative and sound. You know, Virginia, her uncle looked up for a moment with a twinkle in his eye. Good Bostonians always make a point of dying on Friday, so that their obituaries can go into the Saturday evening transcript. No, that is consistent, laughed Virginia. But even the Boston children quote it. I saw the funniest little chap as I was crossing the common today, a short, fat little fellow having a lot of fun with a false beard and whiskers. He was twirling around on one leg to get dizzy, I suppose, and chanting loudly something like this that didn't make any sense. The boy will soon belong to me, unless the transcript he should see. Ha ha, the editorial page, he'll never read until old age. Would you believe it? I never would, outside of Boston. Wendell listened no further. He could hardly wait for his father to drop the editorial section. What a foolish old cobalt, giving the whole thing away, just as the pixie said he always did. Thank goodness. Wendell remembered how his nature study teacher had told the class that even the smallest and humblest of creatures has undoubtedly some place in the scheme of things. Even Cousin Virginia had a use in the world, it would seem. After a long while, Wendell's father laid down the page, and Wendell picked it up inconspicuously, but not too inconspicuously for Cousin Virginia's keen laughing eyes. "'Nice little Boston, Wendell,' she whispered to him. "'The family picture is complete.' Wendell read the page through carefully, every word, 
the weather, the leaders, the paragraphs, the nomad, letters to the editor, facts and fancies, the deaths and the advertisements. Not one word that gave light on the definition of Boston. Wendell sat in a brown study. Presently he went up to his room, hoping the pixie would be there, and sure enough he was. Sounds very probable, was the pixie's comment, after Wendell had laid the facts before him. Of course it doesn't have to be tonight's transcript. In fact, it couldn't be. It must have been before he put the riddle to you anyway. I shouldn't be surprised if you'd hit the bull's-eye this time. That's just the kind of riddle he'd propose, something he read in the paper. That's just the kind of mind he has. There are some people like that, you know, who think if they see it in the paper it must be true. Then, said Wendell, you'd advise looking through the old transcripts till I find it. I could do that, I guess, at the transcript office. He had to wait till Monday, of course. Monday afternoon he went down directly from school to the transcript building which, fitly enough, occupies the historic site of the birthplace of Benjamin Franklin, the great journalist. The transcript people were most courteous and put their files at Wendell's disposal. Through editorial page after page floundered Wendell, and if only he could have understood and remembered half that he read, he would have emerged from the newspaper office a complete specimen of the well-read Boston boy, such as his cousin Virginia pretended to believe he already was. It was nearly dusk before his heart was lightened by a definition of Boston, this one from the pen of Oliver Herford, whom, of course, Wendell recognized as a delightful contributor to St. Nicholas. Mr. Herford, it seemed, was originally a Boston man, though now dwelling in the outlands, and, said Mr. Herford, Boston is a center of gravity almost entirely surrounded by Newtons. It sounded like sense, though naturally Wendell didn't quite understand it at first. After he had read it several times, he began to see the point. Encouraged by the views the pixie had expressed, Wendell decided to stop right in at the Cobalds on the way home. If he wasn't on the slope of the hill, or if he remained invisible there, doubtless the spell that worked before would bring him to light again. But Wendell found no need to use the spell, for the little old kobold was out in plain sight, at least in plain sight of Wendell, though no one else appeared to notice him in the dusk of evening. His eye lit up mockingly as Wendell approached. "'I've got it this time,' said Wendell. "'I found it in the transcript.' "'Oh, did you?' said the little old chap with less assurance than he had shown before. What made you think of looking there? Wendell decided not to tell him. Oh, I read the transcript pretty regularly, he said. This is the answer. Boston is a center of gravity almost entirely surrounded by Newtons. You are right, groaned the kobold. You are right, and gnashed his teeth. Wendell was much interested as he had heard of gnashing one's teeth, but had never seen it done before. Besides, it cleared up that doubtful point in his mind as to whether the white-bearded kobold had any teeth. When the kobold had finished gnashing, he asked Wendell very respectfully, "'By the way, can you tell me what it means?' "'It's perfectly clear,' said Wendell. "'You know the Newtons around Boston, West Newton and Newton Center, and so on.' and Isaac Newton was the man who discovered the law of gravity, of falling, you know. And some people do think there's a lot of gravity in Boston. Grave conversation, I mean. I have a cousin from New York who thinks so. So it's a fairly good joke, you see. No, I do not see, returned the kobold, grasping his head in both hands. But it does not matter, I assure you. I shall not use it again under any circumstances. It is too ultra-modern. You may not have guessed it, but I am a conservative. I guessed the riddle anyway, maintained Wendell, so where's the maiden? She is here, said the kobold, looking down at the rustling leaves, where Wendell now made out the ugly shape of the frog. Maiden, you are free. And there she stood, slim and beautiful in the dusk, and looked at Wendell with the utmost gratitude. "'My deliverer,' she breathed softly. 
"'I suppose you will have to marry her now,' said the cobalt to Wendell. "'It is always customary.' Wendell was sure there was malice in the old fellow's eyes this time. "'Why, why,' he stammered, "'we didn't plan that.' And the beauteous maiden added quickly, "'Not yet. There are my cruel stepmother and the giant to consider. Come, sit with me on yonder bench, and we will discuss the matter.' So they moved away and left the cobalt standing there, and that was the last that Wendell saw of him, though for all I know— the old fellow may still be living under Flagstaff Hill on Boston Common to this very moment. The first thing I must do, said the beauteous maiden, is to hunt up that moving picture man and sign the contract. Then I shall be independent in case you shouldn't succeed with my family. Succeed with your family? How do you mean? asked Wendell. Why, in case my cruel stepmother should work a charm on you, or in case the giant should eat you up. "'Oh, I see,' said Wendell. "'I hadn't thought of that.' "'Well, of course we'll hope for the best,' said the beauteous maiden. "'Here is the address in Brookline. "'You take the car from Park Street. "'You know what you have to do. "'Rob my stepmother of the three magic gifts "'that give her her power as a witch, "'the cloak of darkness, the cap of thought, "'and the book of spells. "'The book of spells has every charm in the world.' "'Why not just take the book, then?' asked Wendell. Of course, the minute he had asked it, he knew it was a stupid question. "'Because things always go by threes, silly,' said the beauteous maiden. "'After the witch is powerless, your next task will be to kill the giant, and the book of spells will undoubtedly help you there. Now farewell, dear deliverer. I must find that movie man.' "'Good-bye,' said Wendell. He was glad to be alone. He had a great deal to face and a great deal to plan. Besides that, he had been rubbed the wrong way by the beauteous maiden, who really seemed to think it was a small thing for him to be eaten by a giant for her sake. He said as much to the pixie, who came in that evening, tremendously interested in the answer to the cobalt's riddle, and eager to encourage Wendell in his next adventure. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Giant's House. Oh, yes, it sounds easy, grumbled Wendell. Just walk into a witch's house and steal her magic cloak. Easy as rolling off a log. Only how am I going to do it, I'd like to know. I might help, said the pixie. I rather like a lark of that kind. "'Oh, if you'd help,' said Wendell, "'that would be great. "'What could you do?' "'Well, I have some rather neat transformation charms myself,' said the pixie. "'I suppose if I once got you into the house, you could do the rest.' "'I guess so,' said Wendell. "'I could hide in the oven or something. "'I'll have to make you pretty small to get into one of these gas ranges they use nowadays,' "'said the pixie thoughtfully. "'You have to think of everything, you know, in this business.' or else you lose by a fluke. I have it. I'll change myself into an organ grinder, and you into the monkey. Yes, jeered Wendell. Nice chance a monkey would have to be let into anybody's house. Well, of course, said the pixie, somewhat crestfallen. It was only a suggestion. It's got to be something that anybody would be glad to have in their house, said Wendell. Something helpful, a furnace man or a gas man to read the meter. "'Nobody's glad to have him in their house,' grunted the pixie. "'But I get your idea. "'Why not a plumber to stop a leak? "'I have a fine plumber's transformation among my charms. "'I'll be the plumber, and you can go as my assistant. "'Good idea, what?' "'The very thing,' said Wendell. "'Well, after school tomorrow you get into your oldest clothes, "'and I'll come around.' "'Wendell hurried home the next afternoon, and hunted out an old suit that he had withheld from the Morgan Memorial Goodwill bag, in case of a painting job or something. Hardly had he got into these clothes when he heard an impatient honking in the street. Looking out, he saw in front of the curb a huge Cadillac, with the driver's seat occupied by a young chap in working man's clothes, who grinned up at him and beckoned frantically. Wendell went down. "'I wouldn't have known you,' he said. "'It's a fine disguise.' 
"'I think it's rather neat,' returned the pixie with quiet pride. He had a young, pleasant, intelligent face, and no one could possibly have taken him for a pixie. He was very suitably dressed, in khaki trousers, blue coat, tan shoes, and visored cap, all somewhat creased and soiled, and a bundle of tools lay on the seat beside him. "'Where did you get the car?' asked Wendell. "'Part of the outfit,' responded the pixie. "'I couldn't pass for a plumber these days, could I, unless I went to my job in a high-powered touring car?' The pixie guided the car deftly down the hill, and turned from the dimpling blue Charles River into Beacon Street. They spun out over the smooth pavement through Boston and into Brookline, consulted the address that the beauteous maiden had written down, conferred with a policeman or two, and at length turned into one of the pretty winding roads that net the Boston suburbs. "'That's it,' said the pixie. "'There's the number.' It was an attractive modern house of the near-colonial style of architecture, white-painted with green blinds, a brick porch, a very well-kept lawn, the whole tasteful but not pretentious. The pixie rang the bell. After a few moments the door was opened by a young lady who, while not positively deformed, was so very, very plain that Wendell knew at once that she was the ugly stepsister. "'Leak in the bathroom?' asked the pixie, with a concise, business-like air. "'I didn't know it. I'll ask Mummer,' said the young lady. She left the door ajar, and they heard her calling, "'Mummer!' as she retreated to the back of the house. "'I might slip in now, don't you think?' asked Wendell. "'No, no,' whispered the pixie sternly. "'Wait and walk in like a gentleman. No sneaking when you're with me, young man.' Wendell felt somewhat abashed and yet resentful. "'I'd like to know if it isn't sneaking to—' he began, but just then a door opened from the kitchen and the cruel stepmother came forward. She had projecting teeth and a hooked nose and chin, and her hair straggled uncombed about her face. "'What do you want?' she said. "'Leak in the bathroom,' said the pixie briefly. "'Your husband telephoned.' "'Oh,' said she, "'right up the stairs there.' The pixie went up with a bag of tools on his shoulder, followed closely by Wendell, and found a neat tiled bathroom. He unrolled his tools, selected a monkey wrench, and went to work on the bathtub pipes. The two women had remained downstairs. "'Well, you're here,' said the pixie in a low tone. "'What would you do next?' whispered Wendell. "'Look about a bit,' rejoined the pixie. "'I'll keep my ear cocked.' Wendell tiptoed carefully into the hall and peeked into the front bedroom. He tried a closet door, found it unlocked, opened it, and peered in at the usual collection of clothes hanging in closets. There was nothing that looked like a magic cloak. He tiptoed into the next bedroom and was investigating the contents of the closet there when he heard a sudden exclamation from the pixie in the bathroom. He went in hastily, asking, "'Have you found anything?' The pixie had entirely disconnected the bathtub and disjointed the pipes, which lay strewn over the white-tiled floor. He was hastily rolling up his bundle of tools. "'I'm off,' he said. "'If the lady asks, tell her I've gone for my tools.' "'When are you coming back?' asked Wendell. "'Not at all,' said the pixie, blithely but hurriedly. "'But aren't you going to put the plumbing together again?' asked Wendell in dismay. "'They can't ever do it. "'I guess they can do it as well as I can,' returned the pixie. "'I never took even a correspondence course in plumbing. So long.' "'But what about me?' protested Wendell. "'Well, here you are,' said the pixie impatiently. "'You said if I once got you in here, you'd be all right. "'I've got to be on the way.' "'Yes, but don't you think the giant may come?' "'I do indeed,' said the pixie, who was now at the top of the stairs.' In fact, I saw him only a moment ago coming down the street. With these words he hurried down, opened and closed the front door, swiftly but cautiously, and before Wendell had recovered from the shock, there arose the purr of the motor, and the car was off. Its sound had hardly died away when there came a heavy tread on the piazza that shook the house. The door was violently thrown open, and a huge voice roared, 
fee fi fo fum i smell the blood of the roar stopped short wendell heard the stepmother's voice i wish you'd learn to control that fee fi fo fum business she scolded you scared the cook so badly with it this morning that she gave notice and here i've had to cook the dinner it may have been all right back in cornwall several hundred years ago but it doesn't go here well i'm sure said the giant i didn't mean anything i do smell the blood of someone it's that plumber upstairs she said come in and eat your dinner plumber said the giant and followed her into the dining room they shut the door but the giant's roar was so loud that Wendell could still hear his part of the conversation, like one end of a telephone talk. Where is the leak? How did you know there was one, then? No, I didn't. No such thing. Well, if he said I called him up, he's probably a gang of thieves. I'll get the police. What did he look like? With a small boy, hey? I knew I smelled small boy. I bet he's one of these giant killer smarties. I'll soon fix him. He rose, shaking the house with his heavy tread. Wendell was a brave boy, but who wouldn't quail before an angry giant? Wendell quailed. He looked around for a place to hide. The bathroom occupied a little L with eaves, and under the eaves ran a wainscoting, broken by a little door that was evidently the entrance to a low closet. Wendell opened it and crawled in, not quite closing the door, as it had no handle on the inside. He crouched behind a trunk, pulled down some old clothes from a nail to cover him, and kept very still, all but his heart, which thumped loudly. "'They're not here,' he heard the stepmother say. "'It looks as if they were coming back, though.' "'They are here,' roared the giant. "'The small boy's here. I can smell him. He's in that closet.' He flung open the door. Bring a light, he commanded. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cloak of Darkness. The stepmother went out and came back with a flashlight. Here, she said. The giant flashed it into the closet, yanked out the trunk, flashed the light in again, straight into Wendell's face, as he crouched there, half covered by old clothes. "'He isn't here,' said the giant. "'No,' said his wife. "'He's been in here, though,' declared the giant, sniffing. "'Strong smell of him. "'Probably the man had him crawl in there to see if there was any leak in the connection,' suggested the stepmother. I hope he'll come back and finish up soon. This place is a mess. What did it mean? They were looking straight at him. The light was shining full on him, yet they didn't see him, not any more than if he were invisible. Invisible? Why, of course! The invisible cloak, the cloak of darkness that he had come to find. It must be this musty old garment that he had pulled down to conceal him in his fright. Sure enough, and now came the terrifying thought. In another moment the door might be closed upon him, and he shut fast in a prison from which there would be no easier escape than if it were a veritable giant's dungeon in a fairy book. He must get out at once. He drew the musty folds securely about him, crawled forward, dodged under the giant's very arm, squeezed close to the wall to pass the stepmother, made himself small not to crowd the ugly stepsister all agog in the doorway, slid down the banisters, sneaked through the kitchen, out the back door, and away. He was free. He scudded down the street as fast as his legs could twinkle, and turned the corner. Which way to go was the question. A nice-looking lady was approaching. Wendell politely took off his cap and confronted her as she reached him. To his surprise, the lady sailed by without twitching a feature. "'Oh, of course, she can't see me,' said Wendell. So he slipped off the cloak and hung it over his arm, and in a moment a grocer's delivery boy with a basket came around the curve. "'Say, can you tell me where to get the car for Park Street?' asked Wendell. "'Sure, kid,' said the boy obligingly. "'Keep on to a big house with a stone wall around it, then take the first street to the right,' 
and you'll come out on the car line. Wendell thanked him and went on, found the house and the wall and the street, and there ahead of him were the electric wires. He got to the corner almost simultaneously with the car, hailed it, and jumped on with a sigh of relief. It was a pay-as-you-enter car. He stood by the box and slid his hand into his pocket for the necessary dime, to realize with a shock that he hadn't a cent with him. These were his cast-off clothes. He knew it was useless to search the pockets. He remembered he had gone through them a week ago when the ice-cream sandwich man was going by. He grinned at the conductor, feeling very foolish, and dropped off the car. Well, of course he could walk it all right, since he had to. It would be simple to follow the car tracks. He stuck his hands in his pockets and started off whistling. "'Hey, kid, you're dragging your mother's cape,' said a young fellow who passed him. Wendell folded the cloak of darkness into a better shape for carrying, then decided to wear it. After he had it on, the inspiration came to him to board an electric at the next white post and ride home free. Perfectly simple. He got on behind an unsuspecting gentleman and took a seat near the door. Across the aisle sat a cross-eyed man. Wendell had always longed for a chance to see how a cross-eyed man worked his eyes, but he had never been allowed to stare at anyone. Now he sat and stared to his heart's content, unforbidden and unseen. He stared with such concentration that he was unaware that another passenger had entered the car. A very stout old colored woman, until, ouch, she sat right down on him. Law Z, she said, and rose up quickly, and Wendell jumped for another seat as fast as his crushed condition would permit. The old woman turned to apologize, to an empty seat. Her jaw dropped in surprise. She glared all around the car, and then lowered herself cautiously into the seat, still muttering. Wendell felt so secure in his invisibility that he made no attempt to restrain his laughter. He roared with mirth and rocked and slapped his knee, till he noticed that the passengers were all looking to see which one of them was responsible for this unseemly noise. This struck Wendell as funnier than ever. He laughed uncontrollably, but he didn't forget again to keep an eye on the door, and whenever anyone got on after that, Wendell rose to his feet with a promptitude that would have earned him a medal as the most courteous boy in Greater Boston, if the courtesy contest editor of the Post could have seen him. As the car proceeded northward, the seats were filled more and more till there was no room for Wendell to sit. Towards the end of his ride it really was too crowded for comfort, for other standing passengers stood on his feet and wedged him in to small spaces, and lurched against him with the motion of the car, and then apologized to somebody else, till he was very glad when they arrived at Park Street, and he could run for home. He went in with the cloak under his arm, and hid it in his bureau drawer. End of chapter 11